What is up, everybody? Thanks so much for being here. Hey, What's everybody. Up? It's good to see you tonight. Uh, so the society page. Hey, thanks. So thanks for being here. Mazzy, thanks for being here. Um, Kim, Miss Dina, thank you so much for being here, everybody. Uh, we are super excited that for this show. Um, when Fancy and Katie Cooley d agreed to come on with us, like that was a big deal because I tweeted it out. There's not many more people out there that know that know more about this case than these two ladies. So we are super pumped, right, babe? I mean, yes, this is, this is the absolutely. big time. Absolutely. And like I said this afternoon when we were talking about the show. They were boots on the ground. They were inside the courtroom. Um, Fancy mentioned the other day that she was at Katie Magbanawa's bail hearing back in the day. So they have been on the case for quite some time. Yeah, and we're new to it. So, like, I appreciate that. And I'm kind of a little nervous because, like, I, <laughs> we don't, like, we, we're new to this case. We, we started when we, we, we filed two trials and then we, we watched this archive trial initially when I started my account in april um someone said you got to check this out and they, they they told me specifically that i'm going to lose my mind on wendy and uh yeah i lost my mind within how long babe i mean just watching her uh we call her wendy bot because she's like a robot she's trying to be a robot up there and she was losing i was losing my mind because it's just like oh my blood pressure but anyway I digress. And we've watched, so we watched the both of the archive trials with our viewers to get ready for the Charlie trial. And we watched all of the interrogations, et cetera. So now we get to talk to two experts. Yeah. And we, we while we we're watching the live trial, they were there, folks. Like, there's very few, like I said, I'm not, there's Georgia, Pat Sanford, and maybe a couple other people that know more than them. So without further ado, uh, Fancy Fiction and Katie Cool Lady. Hey guys. Hi. How are you doing? Thanks so much for coming on with us. We really, really appreciate it. Um, so let's kick it off by if you guys could tell us, maybe Katie first and then Fancy, how did you guys get into this case? What was it what was it the beginning of your watching this this case? Well, I got into it a lot later than Fancy did, so she's really the OG of this. But I, I came into it just kind of like what we spoke about earlier through programs, probably the Dateline. I went back and looked at it today. It was tw in 2020 that came out. And then, um, you know, I just I just couldn't believe this story and that these people had gotten away with it. And then when the Over My Dead Body came out, I have listened to that podcast so many times. I probably listened to it like six or seven times, you know, just to consume. I just started consuming everything that I could about it. And I, I didn't watch the first trial, though. So somehow must, something must have been going on in my life. And I missed that trial. But I did watch the second trial. Then I started like looking around to see what was on the Internet. I landed on Fancy Fiction, some other places. <laughs> I mean, her, I, I laugh about this because I thought, I told her I thought she was a, a young man when I on her page because she was so edgy and her music was so edgy. And I was like, this is a dude. <laughs> I don't know why. But anyway, um, so then when Charlie was arrested, I just turned to my husband and I said, I'm going to go to this trial. I got to go to this trial. And um, then started making plans and went. So that's my story. And what about you, Fancy? Tell, tell the folks your story. Um, I was in Tallahassee in 2016, so I was um, just happened to be, again, boots on the ground, and I was in between a move, um, East Coast to West Coast, and so I remember just the news of the arrest in the town. It was a low, big story, you know, I remember seeing the press conference live, um, and they were very sort of cloak and dagger saying, we're not going to you know, release more inf you know, information, but we've made arrests in the case. In the, the affidavit. Oh, my God, I'm so sorry. That's Jerry Seinfeld. That's my. We we have the hello Jerry Seinfeld when people subscribe. I'm so sorry. All right, that's all. Now go ahead. I'm all right. Sorry. Um. So I um. You know, and then they released the probable cause affidavits, and it was this big scandal. Who leaked them for Charlie and Donna? And then I just became kind of like this is a fun thing to follow, a fun thing to do. And so I just went down to the courthouse a couple times. Never have done that before. And um, yeah, and I sat through the bond hearing in 2016. And then mentor lawyer started uploading Wendy's interrogation and that's just sealed the deal for me. And I've just been, and then I remember over the over my dead body came out. I remember thinking, oh my God, there's gonna be a podcast about my case. 
Um, so it's just been a long time, uh, you know, trial watcher. And this is the only trial I watch, you know, pretty much. So, so nothing before that, that was like the first, like one that you, well, from start to finish. I mean, of course I've watched true crime, obviously there's general interest, but nothing like this, you know, where I've like watched the whole trial start to finish all of them. Very cool. Go ahead. Babe. Uh, how was it to be in that courtroom during this trial? Um, you got to see all the major players in the other trials. You know, I don't, I don't, Charlie wasn't in attendance. Um, you saw Wendy before if you were at the other trials, but this seemed to have just all, all the, uh, King's men. Yeah. Either it's, one it's, of you can answer. Sorry, I should have said. Oh, well, for me, um, oddly, now that you asked me that question, I've never thought of this in this way before, but oddly, it's sort of more dramatic on TV than it is in person. There's something about it being in person that seems like, well, there they are, you know, and, um, you know, I, I was much more daunted around Dan's family and watching what they were going through and, and being in the presence of that. Um, you know, I was kind of blown away by the prosecutors, you know things like that. But, you know, I thought Charlie would be so, he just walked in like a regular old person to me, you know, and then you got to kind of get used to seeing him in there. I went down there though, and I talked to Fancy about this before I went down there. I had first time, I've been to other trials and stuff for the first time ever in my life. I had a strong feeling about jury tampering with this jury. And I wow. thought I'm going to be one person sitting in that courtroom, staring at that jury. So I moved over to the defense side. I checked it out with Ruth Markell because I went there to sit, you know, to be in support of them. But I'm like, I can't get a view there from that part of the courtroom. So, and I was kind of putting that out there because I thought if anybody's going to mess with a jury, it's going to be the Adelsons. And I want it I just want it to be out there that there's a person sitting in that courtroom eyeballing that jury. So that was really kind of my role in the courtroom. I, I made observations and that's what I started doing is just giving my little reports on what the jury was doing and, and just keeping an eyeball on them anyway. So that's what I did. By the way, before you go fancy, we are sharing your, you have fancies on Patreon, Twitter, YouTube, all the links are in there. And we have, uh, Katie Kulig's, uh, Katie Cooley's uh, middlechildbook.com and Instagram on there. So guys, follow them if you're not already. Sorry, go ahead, Fancy. Um, I similar to um, what Kathy said, um, Katie Cool Lady. I found it very um, less dramatic as well in person. I just felt like everyone was less sort of. It felt like I don't know less law and order um, in person, where it was just yeah everyone. You know, this person's, you, it takes away all of, you know, what you already thought about the person. It just becomes like a normal person in front of you and they become very humanized and less a character in this trial that you're watching. So um, I, but on the, on the same token, I like to get back and then watch trial clips and it feels very different. And observing behavior is just that if you want to observe behavior, you have to do that in person. So that was very interesting, sort of seeing something being said, looking to see how the jury's reacting and then looking to see, you know, how Charlie's reacting. I mean, that is also, even though it's the back of someone's head sometimes, um, that is really, that that was very interesting to me. I liked that aspect of it. Well, speaking of that, and maybe Fancy go first and then Katie, what did you think about Charlie? That I was losing it with just his reactions. I mean, this guy just, he, uh, I don't know. And, and we saw at the end where uh, Rasp, his attorney is just fine, like, shut up, dude. Like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious, like, is it when you're there, can you, is their back is like can you see him like reacting or you have to, you have to go back after and kind of see what's what's going on yeah well i mean i could see some like the side of his face sort of diagonal some of the time so i could catch some of it um i think he was i think he was on drugs antipsychotics or something for sure i mean um i thought he was wildly inappropriate when he would sometimes laugh and giggle but it's, it's also hilarious that's comedy gold you know, especially when he's laughing at his, the list of names that Donna yeah. was calling in. I mean, that was hilarious. Um, but also, too, he was a lot taller than I thought he would be because I know people called him, legit called him Screech in high school. So, you know, you kind of walk in with that kind of mindset, but he was a lot taller. Um, I know that he was a very good tennis player. Um, but, yeah, he's bigger in presence than I, I, I thought. Um, but he seemed very, he seemed drugged. To me, you know, I heard a manic guy. I heard a confident guy on those wiretaps. 
And um, he just seemed kind of frozen or something. What do you think, Katie? I, I completely agree with that. Yeah, I expected him to be like one of these defendants who's like super alert and in co- trying to control everything and sending a lot of notes to his attorney and whispering all the time and all that. And he really was not acting like I expected. He was more passive, um, like the weird giggling and stuff. That, and again, we saw that, like we'd leave the courtroom and go home and like watch the feed so we could see his face, you know, that sort of thing. But one thing that was really interesting was the day that he testified, because, you know, a defendant a murder defendant testifying is a very rare thing. And so there were a lot of people, you know, trying to get in the courtroom. There was never a problem getting a seat, though. But it was probably the most packed day. Everybody left at lunch. I mean, the courtroom, because it was so bizarre and uncomfortable. And there's a, a YouTuber called True Lifestyles, and she just really nailed it. She said something like it was this weird combination of putting you to sleep and agitating you at the same time. And I couldn't stand it. I went home at lunch and I didn't even come back. And I'm like, that's such an opportunity to watch a murder defendant on the stand. But half the people left the courtroom. So that was fascinating. You know, instead of more people coming to watch him. And I met people that li- that worked in the area who took the day off to just come down there because like, oh, he's taking the stand. And then they left and just went back to work. It was it was so there was something excruciating about it to to sit in there and watch it. And um, I, I've never seen anything like that. That was very unexpected about him. I mean, do you think it's because he was just everyone's like, he's so full of shit. And like, they, mm-hmm. just, they just didn't want to see him like, just lie in front of like the Markels? Or, or what do you think it was? I, I think it was that. And it was it was just so disturbing, maybe in a way. And there was something about I don't know what it was. There was something about it that was like sleep inducing. It was there was something about it that was just exhausting and agitating. And I, I just couldn't stand the feeling. Now, it was better when the cross examination happened. But of course, we missed it. <laughs> Fancy and I were in the hallway because we showed up late because we were kind of like, I don't really want to get there early. I don't really care about watching the end of his direct. And it was like 15 minutes long. We were guessing it was going to be a couple of hours. So we got stuck in the hallway because they wouldn't let you in while there was active testimony going on. So we watched that. We were sitting there side by side on our on our laptops watching that. And that was more tolerable. But that direct examination was excruciating. And I, I just don't I don't know if I, I need a shrink to explain why that was. Go ahead, babe. Sorry, my daughter decided to come down and get cookies right now. So I was on mute. Um <clears throat> Well, I'll qu- really quickly, I'm curious. Did, Go ahead. did you, I was just going to see while you were in the court. Did you guys see? To me, it looked like Tato uh, gave him a death stare. Because did, did you guys see that, or, or am I to making up? And uh, at the end, or at certain points, was Tato at all looking at Charlie, or am I making that up in my head from what you guys saw? I didn't catch a moment. Um, did okay. you? I thought I saw I, that. But I heard other people say that, um, but I if it happened, I, I missed it. I mean, he was intense there. He was actually pretty chill, but when they started um, testing him about the Latin Kings, that's when he would get, you know, defensive. Right. It's, a, it's a family. It's a family. Right? It's, you know, that's, that's his thing. That right? was the most energy he had was around that. But other than that, he was like a pretty chill guy, you know? The one, so, did you, he did seem pissed when they were like, he's got to come back the next day. I did. Did you guys see? He was like, oh, man. I got, he did not seem happy that he had to come back. I don't know if you guys noticed that. But. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't want to be there. But I thought he did a good job. You know, I mean, he, I, I feel like he always does a good job because he's telling the truth. Like, I, I like, I don't care. Who, like, to me, I don't know what you got. Like, to me, like, other than little details from all the trials I've watched with him, other than like little details, they try to. He's telling the truth to me. I, I don't know, um, but that's why he's a good witness. He's a very credible witness. He's a credible I, witness I, to me. Yeah. I, to me. Sorry, go ahead. Well, with everything that's going on now, we can start with Fancy, and then we'll go to Katie. Um, what do you think about all the pundits weighing in on will the Adelsons flip on each other? Um, I think no one knows. That's what I think about it. I think um, up until the very end, I heard that Donna was all positive talk when it came to Charlie, meaning that um, and I also heard that Charlie was, you know, I don't know. This is rumors, but you know, Charlie was talking, said something very positive about the fact that the bus that would, you know, be dropping him off would be the one taking him to Miami. There was that. And then I actually heard that he was giving away things to his inmates because he was so sure he would be acquitted. But I mean, 
these are things you hear, not things that were said to me. But um, I do know that Donna was talking very positively about Charlie's going to come home. He's innocent up until the very end, very defiant about it. So if something does change, it will be it will be shocking, I think, even to the Adelsons. I think they all went in thinking we're going to hold this story that if you know Charlie's wrongly prosecuted and this is all like that op ed we saw the other day in the Tallahassee Democrat by that author slash doctor <laughs> slash um, whatever. Um, <laughs> just let my work speak for itself. But um, I think that, uh, you know, it's always going to be, they're just going to try to spin it. This was done behind their back and they're all innocent unless one of them flips and Charlie's got a very brief time to do that. And he would have to give up both his mom and his sister. He couldn't just like give up one, but they could probably work something out. Or Wendy flips on everybody preemptively, walks in there. Um, but I think, or Donna, I mean, Donna's off medication, apparently, according to True Lifestyle. She's, you know, naked singing to herself in her cell. Um, I don't know what's going on there, but uh, I think if they do break, it's going to be that's really where it's, this is going to case is going to blow up uh, where it gets interesting if one of them does, but it's a 50, 50 and all the pundits waiting in don't know. And, you know, no one, it's all a guessing game. So it's really interesting. We're at a kind of a inflection point, if you will. Yeah. Big time. Go ahead, Kathy. What, what do you think? One thing that has made, has felt to me like a distinct possibility is from Carl Steinbeck when he said, there's no statute of limitations on murder and those parents are going to die fairly soon. You know, I mean, they're elderly. And when they're gone, Charlie no longer has an incentive to protect Wendy. And he could then flip on Wendy if she's not arrested at that point. And that scenario feels very plausible to me. And that he could be hanging on to that in the back of his mind, because why would he protect Wendy when they're gone? I mean, I think there's animosity there anyway. They've been in periods of estrangement since the murder. Um, you know, he's expressed that she's gotten everything she wanted and hasn't appreciated it and all that. And so I think if he could get out of prison, he would flip on her in a dime with Donna's dead. So and then I think Harvey, if he could save Donna in any type of a way, I don't think he can, <laughs> you know, I mean, he'd have to flip on Wendy, but, you know, I think there would be a, a strong motivation for Harvey to save Donna if possible, you know, but I mean, who, and who knows if any of them would be ever offered a deal, you know, I don't think Donna's going to be offered any kind of deal because she's kind of a slam dunk, just like Charlie was. Why would they right. offer her a deal? Right. I mean, do you, so you think coming into this, they're like, he's getting off where, 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 so I, I feel like that three hours, that little more than three hours it took. You think that was like a slap in their face, like a, a reality check that, wait, people are not going to buy our story. And that's that's when we're, we're start buying one way tickets to uh, t to Vietnam, et cetera. Like, was do you think that was a real slap of reality in their face right there? That how, how quickly it was that that came back? I think they were probably shocked as evidenced by all that flurry of calls that that they were not expecting that. But I do think my personal opinion is that. Charlie set forth that plan. He's the one that did all the research. He's the one we'd be at the airport by now and all that. And I think he's the one that said, if we have to flee, this is where we're going because he loves those little South Asian girls. So he's going to find a country that's of his interest. And I think they just pulled the trigger on his plan that he had already set forth. So that's something that's they be, you think they had already, this is already something they had discussed. And they're like that, once that happened, boom, it's, it's, it's go time. I think they had it all. They probably have money stashed. They, there's probably a whole financial stream that's all, all been set up. I think the whole thing, like if this goes down, this is our plan. And, you know, Charlie missed the window and so did Donna in the jetway. What do you think, Fancy? You think the same thing? Um, yeah, pretty much. Who knows? I mean, I just... Uh, that, that It was so quick. I mean, to us. And then I, I'm curious, watching the jury, did you think it was going to be... You guys... We we see the pundits. We see all the people. We we we're watching on you know court TV or, or law and crime. We don't know what's happening. Did you once were you first of all were you worried about that one juror um, that got the boot, and then second of all, did you think it was going to be that fast? Like w when you were there watching the jury, uh, fancy you go first. Uh, well, I just want to correct you. It was three hours, but then they also had lunch. So oh, technically, sorry. you Less know, you got to take off a little lunch time, so they could have probably done it in like two hours, but because um, they had to eat. So um, 
Uh, yeah, I, 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 I think that that was amazing. I was actually with, uh, with Katie, um, cool lady when we were waiting and I felt good. I felt good about it. I was so relieved when that alternate was a, um, that when it was clear that that was an alternate and he was very upset. He like, Ugh, didn't he, did you see him? Um, you know, you can tell more about, you probably saw it better, but I mean, I was just like, oh, thank God. It was such a relief visceral for both me and for him. Hmm. Um, but I was very worried about him and very, um, I could see the jury checking out, uh, especially during Rosh bomb. I could tell, tell that he had lost them. Um, hmm. so that made me feel really good, um, waiting on the verdict. Well, that's usually, well, that's usually hard to, t it's juries are, I mean, my previous job, I was personal injury when I was watch juries. It is hard to, to read a jury. So if you could definitely read the jury, that must've been like, was it just like, they were just like not paying attention to, to Rosh bomb and like kind of just dozing off or, or what, what do you think? Adam? What was it that like, had you confident? Well, one thing that was very distinct was they all put down their notepads and there were certain ones that were very, very strong note takers. They were taking notes in the most boring, nothing stuff. Like there were three jurors that were very active note takers. And there was a point when during Charlie's case that they just put down the notepads and, and were just yawning. You know, they, they just weren't even taking notes anymore. There was one juror, she was fascinating. I called, I had them all nicknamed, you know, and I called her hard on her sleeve just because I, she was somebody that you could just sort of read her. And um, every single time, like when Wendy testified, when Charlie testified, it was like this woman, because their chairs swiveled, it was like there's something in this woman that senses danger because whenever anybody like that took the stand, she just swiveled her chair like that. And she was the closest to the, to the mm. stand. And then as soon as they went off the witness stand, she swiveled back. I don't think it was conscious. I don't think she was trying to do that. And she wouldn't even look at them. She would just sort of glance, like side eye at them. I, she was fascinating for me to watch. And um, no, I wasn't surprised. I was surprised it was that short because I thought they might really, you know, go over everything. There was a lot That's of a, evidence. It's a lot. It's a lot of stuff. Sorry, let me take it. It just speaks to how many levels of bullshit was his defense? You know, that's all he had was that story. And, you know, you rule that out and that's it. <laughs> you know, that's the answer. And, um, you know, it was just so insulting. That defense was just so incredibly insulting to anybody's intelligence. So I hope Donna goes with the same thing, personally. <laughs> Me too. Why not? Swing for the fences. Go down in one hour, Donna, you know. <laughs> Go ahead, babe. Um, where were you and what was your reaction when Donna was arrested? Um, fancy you go first. Yeah. Um, I was just sitting around and then people started pinging me. One person in particular, I think it was like Twitter. Um, and I, they just like, let me know. And it was because Tim Jansen had put out something. So, they wanted to something. Uh, so um, I picked up the phone and I called Tim Jansen <laughs> right away <laughs> and he picked up. Um, and then I was like, is it true? Is it true? And then he has great sources. So I, I believed him. Um, and then I texted Ruth and I said, Donna has been arrested. I mean, she probably already knew this because of Marcy's law or whatever, but she didn't let on. She was like, how did you know? How did you hear? Um, so, um, I just said how I did. So it was just kind of, you know, I liked how everyone was sort of scrambling for information, but as I, as soon as I heard airport, I knew it was going to be good. You know, it's going to make some drama, <laughs> but like figuring out where she was going and then adding the one way was just another beautiful detail. I mean, it's just the details is what makes this whole case. It really does. I want that body cam, man. Okay. I, I want that video. How, how great is that? Be? that phone with the FBI agent? I got physical. <laughs> oh, my God. I can't wait for that to she come out. I literally thought that that was going to be a thing, that she could just say, no, I was told not to give you my phone. <laughs> Sir, let me speak to your manager. I'm not giving you this phone. Let me speak <laughs> to your manager. And if I can't speak to your manager, I want to speak to your manager's manager. I am not giving you this phone. Like, I can just imagine. I was told not to give it to you. I, know. <laughs> I, I, I know better. Listen, I'm not going to do this. I, I know, I know my rights. Uh, just a joke. But go, 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 go ahead, Kathy. What, 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 were, what was your reaction when you heard the news? Well, I had just landed home from Tallahassee that day. You know, Charlie was convicted on my birthday, and um, so that was 
a celebration. And I, like I said, I was with Fancy. I mean, it was, we had our own drama because we're sitting in this booth in this restaurant, kind of monopolizing that, this booth. And and I'll go back to your question, but I just want to give you this little scene. Yeah. So she goes to the bathroom and Ruth is texting me because we're trying to work out these books she's giving me. And so we got to get together to get these books. Well, all of a sudden we come, become aware that the courthouse is going to get locked up. So if I'm going to get in there and get these books from Ruth, we got to go. So we start packing up. And all of a sudden, Fancy comes back from the bathroom and says, verdict. And so we just start bolting, throwing stuff in our bags. We were there with another friend. She goes, I got the check. And we just start hoofing it to the courthouse like two blocks away. And these guys are much more fit than I am. So I'm trying to keep up. And then this girl joins us. We made it in by the you know, skin of our teeth. We get into the courtroom. I mean, we're sweating everything. I mean, it was just... It was so intense. It really was. And then we got there and I got to say, Fancy took my hand and we were holding hands when that verdict came in. I'll never forget that moment. Um, I love this girl. Anyway, um, so that was that. I just want to share that. But back to Donna. So I stayed a few more days in Tallahassee because I had this Airbnb paid up for, I went there for much longer than I needed to. So I just took a few days to decompress, drove back, took me three days to drive back to Pennsylvania, got here, popped a bottle of champagne with my husband that I saved for the verdict, but never drank. We didn't have time to drink down there, you know? So, and I brought it back with me. We drank this bottle of champagne. I'm like, I got to crash. I got to go to bed. He comes and lays down with me. We're talking and I said, I don't know, there's, there may be another trial. I'll have to go back and go again because I'll go again to another trial. And I said, but I don't know. And he goes, my husband's a really intuitive guy. And he goes, there's going to be at least one more arrest. And then he leaves the room. I go to bed. And the next thing I know, I'm looking at my phone before I go to sleep. Fancy frickin' fiction. I look on there and she says, Don has been arrested. And I was like, holy shit. Right after my husband said that. So I start texting everybody too on my list. I get a hold of Joel from STS. He goes, you want to come on live with me? I'm like, Joel, I'm in bed in my pajamas. I'm just running around grabbing my laptop. and everything. I stayed in my pajamas in my bed I'm on live with Joel just because I like couldn't even get it together to get dressed or anything. And I was on live with him as he was doing the reporter thing, getting, you know, multiple reports. And finally, when he got the third one, he goes, we can confirm, you know, she's been arrested. Yeah, so you were so was, good, by the way. Uh, we were watching that, and I messaged you because you were so good. And like to, to be like, you weren't like you didn't prepare for it. Like all of a sudden, you just get thrown on there. Like you crushed it. So that you were you were really awesome. <laughs> I, I I thought to put my robe on, so I wasn't literally in my nightgown, you know. But yeah, I'll never forget that night. That was wild. So yeah. you both just mentioned texting Ruth, and I and I want to talk to you guys. What's it like to to talk to her? I mean, she seems really awesome, obviously, but. And I, I know, Fancy, I want to talk to you, go over to you first, because you tweeted something like like you had made some, like, uh, I don't know if you went to lunch or something, and you made me made some jokes where maybe, but she was, like, cool with it. Like, what's it yeah. like? Ha- what's it like hanging with Ruth? What's that like? Yeah, it's cool. I mean, we went to, um, I took her to get her hair done, and I got my nails done. And, um, you know, so we spent some solo time with her. And then, um, but what I would say about her is that uh, she has the ability to take away the fact of, like, obviously, this is, such an awkward, unorthodox thing that there's some person like me and, you know, this is all because of something horrible, horrible in her life that she probably thinks about every day. It's one of the worst things to happen to her. But I have, I have taken some risks and made some pretty risky jokes in front of her. Um, and she, she is very cool about it. She is able to separate that with like the reality and she, she's got a great sense of humor and, um, I don't know. She has a light. She's such a positive person too. I mean, she's very positive. And she could tell like, it almost can, I can see kind of like how she could be like Dan. She's just like, you know, I, you know, she'll call, I called her there. She goes, hello, stranger. Cause it's been a little, little while. You know what I mean? So there's just like, uh, I don't know. There's just something very, um, I don't know. There's someone who's from a different generation. Like if my mom or whatever, I say, take away the fact she's my mom, you know, she would be my friend. You know, take away the fact that this is like the victim's mom, you know, of a case I'm interested in. She would still be my friend, if that if that makes sense, if we were yeah. to meet some other sort of way. So that's just the way I feel about her. She's just a friend and she's just a very thoughtful person. And it's just so weird that she can have relationships. You know, she's just, I don't know. She's a people person. I can see where the things people say about Dan, where Dan got it from, that those characteristics. Go ahead, Kathy. What, what's your experience with, with Ruth? 
once again, I got to go back to fancy. I mean, even all these questions are just taking me to home girl, but she's the one that introduced me to Ruth before I went down there. So when I went down there, you know, she, she had already set up this introduction. I think because I reached out to fancy saying, I'm thinking of going to the, I don't know how that started, but she, she put us together. So I, um, had been emailing with her a little bit, but I was really treading softly because I didn't want to just barge into their bubble, you know? So I just wanted to kind of hang back and see what my role was, you know, and if I got invited in and it was just slowly, you know, I got started getting kind of included in, in things and um, then became, you know, quite friendly with her. And then when kind of everybody took off, she and I were still around. So I spent a couple days with her, um, after the trial was over. And I really had a very profound uh, exchange with her where she and I also went and got our nails done. And and I got done before her and I wanted to go to this other shop. So I just kind of cleaned up my my um, account, you know, and then when I came back to get her and she said, I'm going next door. And she said, oh, I went to pay for you and you had already paid for it. Why didn't you let me pay for you or something like that? And we got in the car and I just said, Ruth, you know, because I'm a sister of a homicide survivor. That's my, you know, interest or whatever you want to say into all this and my empathy for her. And um, I mean, of a homicide victim, I should say. And um, I said, Ruth, you, you know, inviting me into a relationship with you is worth more than any manicure I could ever have because you allowing me to be here and supporting you in whatever way that I can is giving me a purpose in life and you can't pay for a purpose in somebody's life. And we had this really like meaningful conversation about all that. And um, I'm going to see her. I, get, I actually have some of her luggage right now because she didn't want to check it. And we'd like to go to Niagara Falls. So I'm gonna, we're going to drive up to Ontario and pass off her luggage to her. And so I'll, I'll get to see her. And now I really, I feel like I have a friend. I'm writing a book. She's written a book. She's been giving me some advice about that. Um, so, you know, it, it, evolved in a gentle sort of way, which I feel good about. Yeah. Watch it. Did you want to talk about the book or on your website or why don't you tell, tell the folks? I'm headed out tomorrow. I'm flying out on Monday, actually, um, to I've been writing it exclusively in the Seattle area. So I'm headed out to do another week of writing and hopefully polish it up. I'm actually looking for an agent right now. I have one agent interested in me. So if anybody out there knows a literary agent interested in a true crime memoir, I have like 39 chapters <laughs> and um, I've been writing it for about eight years. And um, I was given our prosecutor who did both of our trials uh, started writing. It took a year sabbatical and she bought every single transcript of both trials police interviews, everything. And then she just, a year into it, she said, this isn't my story to tell, it's your story. And she gave me everything. So I have totes and totes and totes. So my my story, my book is a true crime book, but it's also a memoir, like much like Ruth's book. It's a memoir and a and a love story to my sister. So yeah, hopefully, um, hopefully I'll be done with it this year. So. I just posted the links again. So make sure you're checking out middlechildbook.com uh, and Good the Instagram. Night. I'm posting the uh, link for the unveiling, which is Ruth Markell's book. We've talked about it on the channel before, and I can't wait to be posting the link for your book, Katie Cool Lady. We will do so as soon as it comes out. And Fancy, what about you? Would you write a book? Because I think you're the go-to. You're the obvious choice for this case to write a book from the from the outsider's perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I don't know. I want to read. Um, I want to read Jeff Lacasse's book, and I want to read Rob Robert Adelson's book, because I feel that um, until their story is told, they've been in, under such weight with not being able to talk or be able to somehow mess up proceedings somehow. But this is so directly weighing heavily on their life. I can't wait to hear what they have to say. And I just, um, you know, it'd be weird to not get their story, um, you know, before because they're the main. They're the they're the ones we haven't heard from that I would love to hear from. Can you imagine the stories that Robert Adelson can tell about the dynamics of his family growing up with a monster in the house, two monsters, three monsters, um, in my opinion, or, you know, Jeff Lacasse, all that crazy stuff that he can't, hasn't probably said, only said on the stand, all that stuff that he, other stories he has, it must be. So, um, yeah, that's very nice of you to say, but I would, um, you know, and then there's, there's, I think I heard that Apple's got this 
script off, based off over my dead body. That's already like, there's already a script and everything. Um, so yeah, but we'll see. there's a lot of stuff in the works. I appreciate what you're saying, but fancy, like you have put in the work. I mean, you like how many hours, I mean, I can't even imagine between all the content you're putting out. I mean, aren't you, you're reporting stuff to, uh, to chuckles, his, his insurance carrier. I mean, you're, you're, you're like the content you're listening. You've got all the, the wiretaps. Like how much, how much work do you think? How many hours? I can't even imagine. Like what's, what's the, the Malcolm Gladwell, the 10,000 hours. I feel like you've got the, the tip, like you've got, you're, you're an expert in this. Like, really? Like, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I definitely, well, it's been since 2016. I got to see the case laid out in person. Um, pretty much, you know, so it's just, um, and then COVID hit. So if COVID didn't hit and we weren't in, wasn't in a hot spot. I don't know if I would have set the time to listen to all those wiretaps. So it seemed like it was like a perfect storm. It's a ton of hours. It's been a labor of love. It's been our pure interest. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a lot of time. I feel like maybe I could teach a course or do something um, with this knowledge. I was joking about making a Trivial Pursuit game. Don't steal that, anybody. Um, Nobody in the chat steal that. Don't well, do yeah. it. We just like the color was the Prius, silver pine mica. You'd have to get really, yeah. really specific. Yeah. Um, Somebody says silver, you're like, no, that's wrong. Mm -mm. And that's like Jeopardy. You have to do, phrase it in the form of mm -hmm. a question. We'll do all you sorts could also of crime con. Yeah. It could be an event at crime con. Absolutely. And okay. I click on um, the go to the corner. Um, so what I was going to say is you have a different perspective, but you also have a very unique way of writing and relating. And I think with humor. And so I think that some of that, you know, it's kind of dark humor sometimes, but I think some of that just makes it, I don't know. I feel like Georgia is kind of the same way. She kind of has a dry humor sometimes. And I think that, you know, you definitely, if whether it's a lecture at CrimeCon or something, you need to do something with all of this because you have invested so much into it. Well, I thank you. I appreciate that. I have not thought about that, um, but appreciate it. Um, so let's get to Wendy. Do, do we think that she's going to go down? Uh, that's the that's the million dollar question. What do you think? Go, go ahead, Fancy. What do you think? You think she's going to go down? I'm calling it. Someone asked me this question. And so I did a deep dive analysis where I like tapped all my my resources and I um, thought about it deeply. And I'm putting it at 85 percent. She will be arrested. And I actually I have all the reasons why I think that is so just even watching the last trial, you know, um, and it's just going to look so bad if they don't. Everyone's clamoring for it. I don't think this immunity thing's a problem. I'm being told that by legal people as well. She didn't, Wendy didn't give them anything to just put, simply put, um, and they can get around it. So it's, it's not, it makes it messier, but it's totally not a, an obstacle, um, I've been told. And um, the cleanest way for that to happen is to Charlie to flip. But if he doesn't, I don't see how they're mm -hmm. going to, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be hard to get 12 people to agree on her. Um, as of now, but I think that, that the reason I'm basing this off is because I'm hopeful that something on those devices they took, they went into the, the Adelson home even, um, that was just new and reported besides just taking off Donna and Harvey's person at the airport. They actually went in that, so they, they knew it, they were looking for something, right? They got a search warrant mm -hmm. approved. So um, I'm just hopeful and um, there's certain indications, a lot of it's just my intuition. I could read a little bullet list that I made myself, you know, making the argument of why I'm at 85%, but, um, you know, Charlie could flip at any moment. Uh, Donna could flip. Donna could plead guilty on her next case management hearing. I don't think she will, but, um, you know, I think that, I think that Wendy, they'll get her sooner rather than later, depending on new evidence that comes out, but obviously they don't want to take their swing right now. I get that. What do you think, Kathy? I, I think, Georgia Kappelman is not going to be satisfied until she's at least given it a shot to go after as many Adelsons as she can. And I think Jack Campbell's right there with her, you know, that they are not going to give up on this. And I think they have enough to go after her. I mean, I think the whole crime scene drive thing is, it cannot be 
overestimated. I think that, is that the way to say it? Cannot be overestimated. Yeah. Okay. Does that sound right? Suddenly that sound like backwards to me. Anyway, um, I think it's just huge. Not the fact that she did it, but the fact that she's lied about it so many times, you know, that is the lying about it, the covering it up sheds more suspicion on that. And that is an action on her part. You know, they need more than just her knowledge of it. They need an action on her part. And that is an action on her part. So, um, I mean, I think the whole thing could turn on that, that drive to the crime scene and how many ways she's lied about it. And I, with like fancy, I think that the immunity thing is going to be very easy to squash because she's lied so many times on the stand and they can use the perjury to get around that. That's, that's what, you know, most of the legal people out there are saying. So, um, yeah, I think they will. I mean, they've been definitely, you know, hitting one domino after the other, after the other. And there's different opinions that, you know, you get them all together and then they start turning on each other. That doesn't seem to be George's way. So I think what makes more sense is that she's going to get Donna easily and then Wendy's next. Uh, well, I tweeted out that I'm going to wear a shirt at the indictment when she gets arrested of her dumb fucking face when she's like, I'm not going to get arrested. What what Was it that the second trial where she, where... Where, where George is like, well, what happened? I forget what the question was. And she was so freaking smug. It was the first one. And, the state uh, with me. And like, that was probably my blood pressure at the highest moment for watching it for the first time. So I'm just going to wear her face with just an LOL on it, go down there and just get kicked out of court. I don't care. Like, that was just, I just, uh, and I'm sure I, I'm, I'm preaching to you guys. Like, like, I'm just new to this. Like, how much rage, like when she testifies, it takes me to a level that I can't, because she just thinks she's so much fucking smart. And I'm, I'm going off. Just She just thinks she's so much smarter than everyone. And like she and she's got her little head twi- and, and like and her mouth open and her eyes. And she got the same outfit. What was it like, by the way? Fancy seeing that in person. Fancy. You go for it. What, what was it like watching that in person? Um. Well, the first day I, I didn't get there. I thought she was going to be day two. And so I did, was very upset at day one because I was watching, but I wasn't in Tallahassee yet. So I was like, I felt so betrayed that I was just going to miss her by that time. But then she, they had to bring her back for day two. And I was so excited when it got extended. But um, I was, um, I don't know. I didn't feel anything toward her. Just looking at her, I didn't feel anything. It was very weird. I was very numb about it all. Um, yeah, it was very, very weird. Uh, but uh, it was interesting seeing John Lauro there, you know, and just seeing her little, just basically seeing the whole little entourage and then her bodyguard or whoever that was. But um, it was just very interesting. I just, um, I felt very numb about it. I was expecting to feel enraged. Like, I hate her. I hate her. Um, but I just really wasn't was very numb. Uh, it was like, any other person that's part of the, the illusion that gets stripped from you when you go into the courtroom is that they people lose their like movie star type quality that they have uh, when you watch it on tv that's so interesting that's really interesting and by the way you had like the picture was it your picture or you, i don't know if it was one of your when they were like out eating lunch at like the place that was nearby was that you fancy that posted i thought you did like they were out at, at like a place that was across the street or something yeah or was it- that was at um there was one i posted with um her with wendy and her team her legal team yeah. um that was i think at their hotel at oh, the, okay. a lot. yeah someone sent that to me you know so i can't take credit for being the one to take it but i have spies right well that's yeah. that's another thing like how many people do like i can't have like the amount uh-huh. you're you're a resource bank of people that like it's a bit like the cia it's just i have i'm like a case officer um and i've just got my assets out there and i think i've been pretty good so far i've been you know obviously respect my, you know, keeping my privacy and things like that. So people think, you know, and then ever since I've shown my face, people have felt more comfortable, like, oh, that's a real person. So I've actually had some people reach out. Um, recently has been quite good. I've actually got a couple people that I have to answer that have, have reached out. Someone sent me a picture of their artwork that they did. You know, it's just, it's very touching. Um, I got a couple people got emails. Um, someone saying, I'm sure you get like, you know, drown in emails. And I'm like, I really don't. It's so funny. Um, so it's actually kind of endearing like that, making connections. Um, but some people are very well placed. It's, it's it blows my mind. It blows my mind. Um, well, to me, I think, I mean, at least for me, the, I, like I connected with you because like 
you're not there's no fluff there's no bullshit you're just calling it like it is and like i really appreciate that and i think that's why a lot of people connect with you because i think sometimes you could see a lot of fluff and bullshit and you're just kind of calling it calling it as it is so i appreciate that but go ahead um what what, what for you kathy what was it like for you when you saw wendy bod adelson in the uh in there I, I, very similar to what Fancy's saying, but for me, I'm sitting there thinking, I mean, I think Wendy Adelson is straight up evil. I think she's the most evil of all of them. I do. And it's, it's this weird feeling of like, she looks and, and presents like a very normal person, sort of demure and that sort of thing. But in the, my head, I'm remembering she killed her kid's dad, you know, or she's instrumental in that. Like she is a very toxic person. So it's like, it's bizarre seeing her because she's very good at presenting that, you know, that demure part. One thing that really was very disturbing to me was when she was sitting right in front of the Markels. And like, how dare she? How dare she think she can sit in that proximity to Ruth and Phil Markel, like, boom, right in front of them. That was disturbing to me. Um, And also her real shitty remark to Ruth about, or, or about Ruth, I should say about, well, that's unconstitutional about, I mean, it was just gratuitous and for no reason. And, you know, her little nasty evil side couldn't hold back, but she's very practiced in that. And she's very smooth. I thought it was really interesting, probably the most interesting. Well, she did have that bulldog that was, you know, hovering over her and she gets to be the little lamb and, you know, all that. But I thought one of the most interesting things was how little contact she made with Charlie. No eye contact. In fact, during many parts of the testimony, there were sidebars, meaning everybody is off to the side behind this sort of wall of glass. And so she's just sitting there with nothing to look at, except for her brother, who she's distinctly not looking at. And he was also not looking at her, which I mean, I didn't know how to interpret that, you know, unlike June, who's just, you know, the whole time staring at Charlie, you know, but Wendy was just bobbleheading around up there looking at anyone but him. I thought that was interesting. By the way, she knew that was unconstitutional, but I'm, now I'm drawing a blank. What was the easy... Contempt. She didn't contempt. know contempt. She didn't know what contempt was, but she knew that was... Un- like, what a fucking joke she is. I don't know what contempt is. I'm just a she lawyer. And- she didn't read the indictment either. No. Right. <clears throat> what an absolute joke. She makes me so angry. I'm sorry. I'm not going to... She needs a good cross-examination is what she needs. She needs a good, hard cross-examination. And I think Sarah Dugan would be the one to do it. <laughs> My opinion. I'd like to see that. Yeah. Oh, uh, I just had a question. Oh, I know what I was going to ask. Um, not about Wendy. Not about. Oh, so you have seen Fancy. You have seen Katie in person because you saw her at the bond hearing mm-hmm. that you mentioned the other night when I was listening to your channel. Um, what was it like seeing Katie? Katie 2.0, Katie, who's now like telling her her truth. Yeah, it's it's weird. I, I found her proffers to be very frustrating, um, you know, infuriating, actually. Mm-hmm. But um, that is just someone who's so mentally uh, warped at that point. Um, no therapist can. Uh, she is the rock that therapists probably throw themselves against at this point um, because she is just so hardened. Uh, to come and clean, even though she came some sort of version. I don't know if there's more there um, that they haven't shown or haven't disclosed, but um, I, um, she looks very mousy to me this time, particularly, maybe it's the way her hair was done. She was in purple. She seemed very clean cut. Um, I don't know. I, there just seemed also a bit of a lightness. She was speaking very quickly and succinctly and confidently as opposed to saying her, I don't know, can you remind me? You got records for that, all of that, just kind of. Mm-hmm. Um, so that her demeanor was quite different. Um, I think she held her own against Rashbaum. I mean, she's been in jail holding her own. So she's probably like, yeah, bring this guy up. Let's, uh, he's nothing compared to what I've been dealing with. Um, so yeah, seeing her in person, same thing. It was just, it's very, uh, it's almost like a bit of a, like anticlimactic, Again, just another, you think, I think it's because your expectations are there's going to be some sort of emotion in you, but you're just basically seeing someone you hate, you don't like, you know, uh, but she's, she's little, she's little, she's very short. Um, so I'm curious, this is, this is, I've been thinking about this a lot. 
What do you think it's like right now with Harvey and Wendy? Like right now, like so they like they're I, I just can't imagine like I, I I assume Donna was doing a lot of shit for I mean you guys know way more than me, but I assume Donna was doing a lot of the work for the kids. Um and I just I don't know. What how what do you think it's like right now? What do you think's going on right now? What do you think that dynamic is? Uh, Kathy, you go first. What, what do you think is going on right now in that family? I, I just can't even imagine. I mean, and by the way, this happens right before Thanksgiving, right before, like, I, I this must be such a, sh- a shit storm going on right now. It's just got to be super strained because, you know, Donna was the glue probably that held all of them together and the controlling one. And I think she was more the parent to the boys than Wendy has ever been. Um, and so... Wendy is now having to negotiate parenting. She's probably already found people to fill in that role so she doesn't have to do it. And um, whether it's her weird friend Tova or whoever, you know, and um, I think it's really probably pretty strained between them. I'm curious about how much contact they're having with Donna, um, who's probably not in a great position to be ringleading the whole thing right now but i think i think there's probably a lot of tension right there between them all and as it should be i hope they're imploding oh me too what, what do you think fancy well i can tell you not what i think but i can tell you what i heard oh all right <laughs> there we go here we go um according to some sources um harvey and i haven't heard anything i haven't asked but i haven't heard anything you know this week or um, but particularly the, within the first weekend after the um, arrest and the, I don't know, the first week or 72 hours or whatever, um, Harvey and Don, and uh, Wendy were together. I do know that. Wendy was showing up right away next morning um, at, you know, acting normal at events, kids. And um, out her and Harvey and Tova and um, Wendy's boyfriend uh were at um the kids events like putting on a brave face um very stoic acting like out in politics out and about um and so i did i did hear that and i hear that they're together and i hear harvey's a mess harvey's a real freaking mess i don't know what's going on wendy's probably keeping it very tight but i do know that they're together so that's that's sort of my where my knowledge ends but i do know end that it was like put on a brave face right away i don't know if it was for the kids or whatever but there was uh it was very stoic out in public together her and um right away her and harvey um you know shannon talked about this in that it's kind of and and we we you know because we have we have a 13 year old that we have their two 13 year olds and 15 year old, but they're, the, the kids are getting at the age where you would assume they're seeing like they have to be seeing stuff at this point right on on any social media, I, maybe not. Maybe I'm, maybe I, I'm. But they're kind of they were they've been in this bubble right for so long. The kids, right? I do you guys think that bubble's got to be breaking, right? Like there's got to be some stuff breaking in to that bubble where they're starting to see stuff. What, what do you think, Kathy? Am I? Do you think that's accurate, or do you think they're still like not aware? I think that's accurate. I think that's teenagehood that they are entering, if not in, and that's a powerful force. So is falling in love and they're entering that phase of life where you start to fall in love with another person. And that might be a force that wakes them up to some sort of reality. They might fall in love with somebody who sees the truth here that you know may wake them up. I'm hoping that adolescent rebellion coincides with the age of emancipation so that they can ride that wave of momentum. And I hope that the spirit of Dan Markell is strong and living in these kids that is going to push them out of that toxic web. And that's what I'm putting my energy around for them. That would be amazing. What, what do you think, Fence? Do you have any information on if, if they are? I mean, I, I guess that would be difficult to, to know. But if anyone would know, it would be you. Um, I have heard. <laughs> I have heard that, um, that right now the 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 boys are still obviously on, you know, nothing's broken with them um, in terms of understanding this and that they are being told that actively that the internet is big part to blame and that it's a conspiracy theory against their family. So they're being told that this is an evil thing that don't listen, you know, it's a 
I have that on good authority. But then you also, like you mentioned, you're coming of age, you have these kids. It's coming of age of like, think if your kid was good friends or best friends or in the same after school club with somebody where this is going on, you're going to have to sit down your kids and say, hey, look, you know, something's not right with uh, with Timmy. And uh, Timmy's living in a bit of an alternate reality. And but I need you to know as my child, the truth and about Timmy and his family. So that whole dynamic is, can you imagine sitting across from your child having to explain this about their friend? So well, someone's going to And can you imagine, like, I, I know with my child in that situation, I would be like, your friend Timmy is welcome to our house at any time because they're welcome here, but you are not going over there mm -hmm. because I don't trust their parents. I don't trust the influences in their, in their home. And well, so I'm sure that that makes her. it difficult. Yeah. She's on I mean, the murderer, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's what most people think. I mean, that she was active participant in the murder of their father. And there's no way in hell most parents would let their kids go to a murderer's home, you right. know, for even a meal, much less a party or a sleepover, you know? So, yeah. Well, hopefully, like you said, uh, that was, that was so well put. Let, let's hope Dan, Dan's spirit is in them and, they, and they're going to, they're going to uh, beyond the rebellion, like they're going to break out of that bubble. Cause that's, and then, you know, so let's, let's hope that happens. Um, baby guy, I can't believe it's already been an hour. You guys have been amazing. Um, Anything we didn't I'm touch sad on? Sad that it's been an hour, because um, I could ask them questions all night long. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, well, how about <laughs> how about you mentioned her, Katie? How about June? I mean, what what was that about face? Do you think that it was a payoff? Oh, a monetary payoff? Yeah. No, I, well, I mean, that might be part of it, but I think she is truly probably still in love with Charlie Adelson. I think he just lassoed her in, in some sort of emotional codependent stuck way. And she's, I mean, it's sad that she's never been able to progress from that. I mean, we've all been in toxic relationships, but this one's pretty bad. And I think hopefully she can find her way out of that, but I don't think it's just money. I think she's still probably very emotionally attached to that man. Something he did got her stuck. And I know you've followed her socials for quite a while, Fancy. What do you think of her? Because you've you've seen all sides. I feel like of her. Yeah, I um, I concur with with what um, Kathy just said. Is that um, and also just I would note about her is like uh, I was really rooting for her. You know, it's like we've all guys and girls, you've been with somebody who's just awful to you and just it's awful. And everyone goes through that at some point in life. So when I um, saw how um, how reluctant she was to be forthcoming with Charlie in that that first trial, um, well, I was glad she did, you know, the money, you know, she told about the money and she was very she was pretty forthcoming in that FBI interview that she did with mm -hmm. Sherry Bennett. Stanford when they came and, and got her after the breakup. And I was like very excited about that. And I always just was like thinking she's just going to meet somebody and it's just going to be like, this is all gone. And that guy's going to say, you know, way I'm letting my, <laughs> I'm protecting you. I'm someone, you know, someone to protect her from that and uh, swing her out of that mindset. But that never happened. And she really, she did tell different stories, especially this last one. A very simple one is she was asked very, the first one, she was asked about the staples and she's, tried to backtrack that that's perjury and, and George had to go walk up and say you know so there was that and so I just kind of saw this and I too gave her like oh it's a trauma bound bond you know she's abused I'm rooting for her um and through those two trials I was still kind of like it would be awesome if she was the one that kind of like sailed off into the sunset like you see in the movies where like she's yeah. now like a like conglomerate or something you know what I mean <laughs> yeah. like, it's just mm -hmm. like the most absurd you know um I wanted that for her but then, um, and, you know, I was supporting her a little bit openly and, and she, her as well. And then, um, yeah, and she got up and even about the breast implant, she was asked to Charlie say that he paid for a breast implant. She goes, no, for Katie's breast implants. And they went by it. But the last trial, we all heard it when he said, well, he joked about paying for half of it, he paid for one. So they split it. So it's just like, you know, how can I, and then saying that happy birthday or whatever she said, you know, in front of the parent, I just was like, I'm done. 
you know? Um, it, it felt personal at that point where she was just like, she had made a choice to be bad, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and then everyone's like, you're being mean to her on the internet. I'm like, I'm not being mean. I'm pointing out what I just said. So, um, I think you make a good point that it seems like at that point she made a choice when she went over and initiated that contact with him, knowing what she knew and and having, you know, the time and space away from him. She she definitely was making a choice. Yeah. Uh, so I, I can't believe I forgot. That. I wanted to ask you guys this. Was there anything that happened in the trial for you guys that know so much about that was that came out that was surprising to you? Was there any information uh, the washing money was that I, I'm new to this. So you guys know pretty much everything. Was that new to you? Was there, or was there anything that came out that you're like, oh, I didn't know that. Or did you pretty much have all of it? Uh, Fancy, go first. Um, the washing money was new. Um, I'm trying to think what else that was new that kind of surprised me. Um, there's a lot more text messages that I hadn't seen or correspondence. You know, the paella birthday present thing. Wow, that was a real... That was a real nugget that I did not be dad's big birthday gift. That was amazing. And clearly more code. Um, I've actually got a great paella uh, graphic idea today that I, um, I just want to plug right now. I haven't done it yet, but um, this will make me go on. Well, perfect it. timing because we just shared your links. If you're not subscribed to the YouTube, make sure you are Twitter and Patreon. Go ahead. Sorry. And so, um, yeah, that was also really fun because I just love seeing Wendy squirm, you know, of course not. That was just so, that was delightful. I appreciated that very much. Um, I just thought that like now the Wendy tone is just undeniable that she's the white whale. That surprised me where I'm like, they're going to, they might actually get her, especially listening to the closing statements. And if you look at how they're making a big deal about her actually texting Dan about his plans and then the yes. rental car being rented and short, or like if it was like, bam, 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 bam. Yeah. Um, and she's at their house. She's at their condo. They got her at the condo texting. I thought to me, I don't know, that presentation they did where they, the with the arrows and, and, <laughs> and the dates, to me, that was the most compelling thing I've ever i know i'm not watching trials for a long time but that was the most compelling evidence like i was like this is that like, was this a is, business presentation this is pity this there's a lot there and this is putting it together because why are they all contacting each other so much and then that one slide with the pie graph where charlie is is calling except for like the one you know 50 call Sorry. whatever call where he's where he's calling the landline to me that's why they could get wendy if, if like you can get a jury and you can get that presentation to me that nails them all. That text at, like you said, Fane, that text when she's at her parents' house, like, oh, where are you going to be on this weekend? To me, that's like. And also in conjunction with Jeff Lacasse saying she was canceling, you know, the, you know, it was supposed to be that weekend and she pushed it back. And there's all mm -hmm. sorts of things, that, like, at least in terms of scheduling that implicate her. Rather, it rises mm -hmm. enough where they feel like they're ready to go. But Georgia, like I said, Georgia's got all the time in the world. We don't. The Markel don't but um the boys don't but uh these are people these are very smart people and uh you just can't make any freaking mistakes and if you're gonna go you gotta make sure if you, you know what is that f phrase it's like you gotta kill the king if you swing you're gonna make sure you kill the king so right don't miss. swing don't miss i i, I think yeah. yeah something like that like you know you gotta kill the king or something but um yeah and uh, plus it must be torture watching your family go down one by one you know, for me, people are like, why don't you cover other cases? I'm like, I don't have to. There's trials coming right after the other. Um, so that's kind of like the mob boss. It's like a grandma. Grandma guy. Yeah, grandma grandma guy. guy. Dumb Corleone. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, was there anything that you saw? Anything that surprised you? New stuff? Um, also, I thought, by the way, that one, I wasn't aware of that one text message from uh, Sigfredo. Or not, was it, it was a call. Huh. It was a voicemail, like a thirty-seven to Harvey. To Harvey, that was shocking. Did you guys were you guys aware of that? Was that something that was out already? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. It was a mistake call. It was so according to Yindra Velasquez, her testimony in the retrial, she says that it was a mistake that after that July first incident, um, he got Katie's phone and saw like Doctor Adelson or something like uh, that, and that mm -hmm. all that thinking he was okay. like he found Charlie's number or th oh, that was but we only know that according to because that's what yindra said katie told her okay so 
So I'm sorry, I cut you off. Was there anything, Kathy, that you that was in there that uh, was surprising to you or new to you? Um, I think just the things that you brought up. I have a theory about the stapled money, and you know how Donna. Um, I don't know where it came in about how she said she has her piles and Charlie's piles, and you know with the um, in the safe of cash, and then the accounts, the bank accounts. There was Harvey and Donna, Wendy's account, which is probably where she was secreting money away from Dan when they were in that financial thing. She had half a million dollars in that. Um, Charlie's solo account and then a Charlie and Donna account. Mm -hmm. So there was a whole that had $2 million in it. That was new to me. So I thought, is that their murder money? Like, why does Charlie have an account with his mother alone? Um, mm -hmm. So I thought that was interesting. But my theory is that I think Donna stapled the money. I think Charlie's situation was looking kind of reckless with people coming and going from his party house and all that. So mommy, is, you know, makes his little lunch for him every day. So she has his <laughs> stacks of staple money. She washes it and she staples it. And here you go, honey. I mean, that seems like so much of a, more of a Donna move than a Charlie move. When I started thinking about that, Charlie's just way too haphazard and reckless. It makes mm -hmm. sense that he'd have his little stacks of staple cash. Okay, you ready for, you need your allowance this week, honey? And that she was feeling like their, both of their money was more safe in her safe than his safe. You know, mm -hmm. just because of his like wild and crazy lifestyle, because he was so dependent on her. He was willing to, I, I don't know. I just think it's a good chance that Donald with Donna was stapling that money. And, but of course he had the stapled money, but I think the freaking staplers in her house. Interesting. Is it the red or one? one other interesting thing. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. No, 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 no. I was going to just say, is it the red one like Milton in office space? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> this is just an interesting little side story, not having to do with evidence, but how many people are watching and reading us? <laughs> Because Fancy got approached in the courtroom. I won't tell her story. But someone I just went to say hello to and took a risk to approach. I won't say this person's name, but a very instrumental person in this case who saw me coming and said, Katie knew me and said, I've been reading you. I've been following your blog. I've been appreciating all that you've been writing on sociopathy and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, you even know who I am? So there are people out there that are very close to the center of this case, some right up there in the well, who um, are paying attention to those of us out there. So that surprised me. Uh, fancy, do tell if you want to tell, or uh, I, I there's some influential people that are uh, that are checking you out, following you, reading your um, stuff, watching your videos. You don't have to say if you don't want. Yeah, to. I mean the, the I think that the I mean John Loro came in and tried, I got to do that graphic showing all of our correspondence. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, Rashbaum came up and introduced himself to me, um, which I thought was hilarious that he like, he, I guess he had heard my voice or something, but um, that was funny. He introduced himself and um, was very complimentary. I was, I was like, oh, this is going to be very good or very bad. because I saw him kind of like make the decision to come over. Um, were you there, Kathy? I don't think you were there. Were you there? No, but that. I made you reenact that scene about 15 times. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Make it a reenact it because we would act it out like how he approached her. I was like, you got to do it again. Yeah, it was very funny. Um, I'm trying to think someone. Yeah. And then there's all sorts of people like someone like before we were sitting down, someone was a couple aisles back and goes, Psst, I recognize your voice, by the way. You know, just like little stuff like that. Um, it's just funny. Um, but uh, yeah, it was kind of a it was interesting. I see this comment that says uh, Donna is from Queens, New York, and Gotti is. And little known fact, my mom went to Queen Co went to Queens College, where uh, Donna went to college. Uh, that's I'm curious. I don't want to keep you guys on too. Much. I appreciate you guys. Are you guys? I know. I know Shannon tried because I'm dying to know what Donna was like. Can you get any information? Because babe, you tried right to find stuff on her, but you couldn't find pretty much because her name is pretty. Being that her maiden name was so common, it was difficult to find. Like, I mean, I you know people have posted like the yearbook photo or like a class picture, but not a lot of. And her mother's name 
was like, I always, my sweet spot for looking up people is obituaries. Like I always look for the obituary because they will always, without a doubt, print the people's names of their kids. They'll even print like kids they've lost before. I mean, you can find so much there and I could not freaking find an obituary on this family. And it was just driving me nuts. So have you guys been able to find anything? Cause I, I, I can't just imagine. I'm just trying to picture what, uh, how Donna grew up to make her so fucked up but um, just before you start that i will tell you that this was before we had ever had contact with you fancy and i was like in my mind like i know fancy fiction probably knows this and i was <laughs> i need to find out i have to find out so i thought about you in that moment i was like she probably already knows this by the way so, I and be, be, background? what's that you want to know about donna's Not background about her background um Donna had a brother <laughs> um, and had a mom that was very much like Donna and was very much, uh, I mean, it's like, it's almost like you, at least like you can hear it hold a little bit of a mirror to Donna's mother and similar dynamics. It's not my story to tell, but um, started feuds and maybe doesn't have a bet. Donna's mother didn't, wasn't kind to her own son the way, same way that Donna was with Robert. And we'll leave it at that. Um, but there's like some, there's a pattern there. And, um, if you can probably put two and two together. Um, and I think that I do know, I did hear that Donna was voted best legs, Miss Queens college. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting stuff. Yes. Uh, um, <laughs> um, what else do I know about Donna? Um, She's a domestic coordinator. Domestic coordinator. And she basically is just a very pleasant person as long as you're doing what she says and she's getting her way. And if you're not, she's a, she turns, she snaps like this. She's very vicious. I hear like one of the things like, um, you know, someone would get hurt or something in the house and Donna and Wendy would always be the ones that hysterically like laugh um, in terms of like, they have similar, like very nasty personalities, like just terrible. Um, or like, you know, just, just like, like a, Wendy's a little Donna behind closed doors. That's what I'm hearing. Um, and it's just going to be so interesting once, cause a lot of people are very scared. You know, I think there's a big surge of people coming out and talk that knew the family. Um, you know, I know that for example, someone like I put a, a screech thing up and, um, on like Instagram or something on like a story and someone came back and he goes, a uh, woman goes, screech. She, she's like, that's what we all called them in high school. We're all like losing our minds talking about this. And everyone's reconnecting. Like it's like a reunion that everyone that went to school with the uh, Adelson kids are all like reconnecting. Like, can you believe that this is happening? But I think a lot of people were even after Charlie was because he's so vindictive. He's got so much money that he kind of like it's been said that he he enjoys punishing people and getting revenge in ways that can't be traced back to him and can read about that in the police report. But so I think a lot of people were very reluctant to speak out. Look at Ryan Fitzpatrick, for example. Uh, but once they, it was clear that Charlie's gone away, not his money's not going to let him get out of this. You know, a lot of people probably saw him get out of stuff and stuff. So I think that people are coming out and starting to talk about it a little bit more freely with less reservation. Um, and I think also too, that's going to happen with Wendy. It's already kind of starting to happen now with people contacting me. Um, but you know, why speak out about somebody and put your neck out there if they're never going to be here, they're never going to arrest her, things like that. So I think right. you'll get some, well, I think we'll get more answers to that. Um, the further this goes along, people feel more free to speak. Speak, you know, speaking of Don, I thought something that was like that was like, uh, I don't know, mind blowing. Maybe not mind blowing, but like she, you could hear the swings. She's pushing the kids on the swings as she's pe planning to cover up her her murder, like the murder that she has done. And it's like uh, pretty essentially almost all the calls. There's there's the kids in the background, and that is just she's raising those kids. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's why, like, I can't imagine what, like, you guys, you know, you talk about what she's probably when he's doing now, but yeah, they're they're always there with an earshot, right? I mean, yeah. And even I was watching, um, I think it was Mentor Lawyer, Deep Dive True Crime, posted Tamara's interview um, again from, um, and I was just like, I watched a little bit of that again after not watching it since it came out. Um, 
you know, we published it the first time, but in there, she's talking about how Wendy is always gone. And Jeff said that as well. She's out of here when she's not supposed to be here. She's always traveling. She's not here, but she was talking Tamara also backed them up separate. They didn't like know each other. They weren't friends um, when all this happened. So these are two independent sources from their life coming in. And Tamara said, she's never there. And sometimes like, she'll be gone. She'll leave town. She'll leave them with somebody else to spend the night, like to care for them instead of like as a dig. And um, Dan would get very upset about that, right? Her first refusal. Right. So the problem is like, she just basically seems like she didn't want to, she didn't want to parent. I don't know, like, you know, or she just wanted to do it. Like she wanted to be the um, every other weekend parent or something. Right. I don't know. It's a very weird thing to think, say that about a mother. But, um, and of course I don't know it. I don't know her, but that's just evidenced by seeing independent sources that know her and hearing Donna's calls that she seems pretty much absentee and um, has other people do the parenting for her. Um, she, she didn't want to parent, but the family wanted to win. They just yeah. had to win to the point, And I've, I mean, I'm sure you got to the point like they, they, I feel like they just got everything in their lives, their whole lives got away with everything to the point that they thought they could get away with murder. And I mean, really close to getting away with it. They almost did, right? I mean, they were they were really close to getting away with murder because they just lived this life where that toll booth. what's that? That toll booth is what got them. That toll booth when they got that saw that Prius and they finally found that toll booth and they could get that you know rentals agreement and then they got Harvey's phone and then it was they yeah. almost they almost got it. And I, I sometimes I think about this and like what his life had been like before they killed him, like the shit that they had to put this family having to deal with this. Cause I went through a pretty contentious divorce and like it consumes your life when it's tough. And I just can't imagine what it was like having to deal with this family before. Just I can't, like, and we've seen the evidence of the, these emails that, that she's sending with, with, with the Nazi youth uniforms and the let's convert them. But anyway, I digress. I just, hopefully we get justice. Hopefully Wendy goes down. You know, Charlie's already gone down. Donna's next. There's no way Donna doesn't go down, I don't think. And hopefully they just start eating each other and just, I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm going on a, a tangent. No, that's going to be the real interesting part is when, when and if they start turning on each other. That's going to get really good. And they have a, a hearing at the same time coming up, right? The 12th, they're both at the same uh, the same day. What, what, are, what are the odds of that, huh? Yeah. Um, But I guess we'll see. Will so. you be going to the courthouse for that fancy? No, I probably won't. <laughs> um, How about you, Katie? Will you get another Airbnb for the 12th of December? <laughs> I'm going to be in Seattle at that time, but so I'm not going down there for it. But I did tell Ruth that I'll be there for any and all other trials. I, I mean, I, I'm like fancy. I'm not really interested in other, you know, peripherally and what's going on in other cases, but I wouldn't be drawn to go to another trial other than something in support of Dan Markell. The nice I want to say, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was just go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I just wanted to add something about, you know, it's the devil's in the details, you know, and there's there's one detail that really hit me so hard about Wendy's pathology slash evilness was, you know, they were fighting, and I thought one of the best witnesses that was also kind of underappreciated was Stephen Webster, who was Dan's divorce attorney. Mm -hmm. And that was actually a surprise, him coming in, because we hadn't seen him in other trials. And I thought he offered a lot of good information, not the least of which is that he kept emphasizing that Dan heard on the FaceTime Donna calling him stupid. It didn't just come from the kids. You know, of course, Charlie tried to minimize that. Oh, the kids, you know, what three and four year old is going to make that up? I'm uh, pretty sure you don't say things around three and four year olds because they're going to repeat it. But anyway, but, you know, he kept emphasizing that. But anyway, um, some piece that had just hit me in this trial was that, you know, the whole thing is like Dan's fighting back, Dan's fighting back, Dan's hitting her hard in the legal system. And like, he's being aggressive and, you know, irritating the whole situation. And Dan's taking some hits for that and um, using, you know, the legal system aggressively and all that. But the morning of the murder, he sent her an email or a text about this school business and I mean, he was pissed about it because his own attorney said he was very angry about that. But still, he contacted Wendy and said, I think we should go for a walk at school and talk about it. 
That is not a person who's using the legal system to beat somebody up. That's somebody who is extending a hand. Let's take a walk. That's a very congenial activity. That's not even a phone call. That's not even a sitting across confrontational. That's let's just take a nice walk and talk about this. That's somebody who's wanting to work something out with somebody. And he sent that to her and she knew he was going to be dead that day. And the fact that she could go through with that, with him extending that olive branch like that, it's not even like it was in a moment of like him pounding her. It was in a moment of him extending a hand to her and she killed the man the same day. That's, that's a special kind of evil right there. That's such a really good point. And that had to be hard for him. That is hard to do. Like for him to be like, listen, let's like, and he, and he did it. And like you said, she knew he was going to be dead. And well, that speaks to his character. Right. And that's because he was probably regularly doing stuff like that, trying to reach out to her, trying to work things out with her. He was also using the legal system, but that speaks to his nature, right? You know, and that he wasn't just this aggressive guy being legal. He was really sincerely trying to be a decent human being, which is really how all of his friends and family describe him. And it's evidenced in black and white by that small text or email, whatever that came in, but that is an evidence that about wanting to go for a walk. And um, she killed him that day. And I really hate to hear, I mean, I hate to hear any murder victim take hits, but Dan takes a lot of hits because of how aggressive he was. But um, Jay and I have both been through divorces before this. And if you are not a dad that is willing to be aggressive, you will not see your children very often most of the time in America. And so that he went in there like that, I think speaks only to the fact that he knew that the court was stacked against him being a dad and that he knew that he wanted to fight for his kids. And so- he struck with blood by the Pearl Harbor. You know, they started it long before. I mean, here she's leaving him, but she's, you know, trying to destroy him on the way out. So, I mean, it's all started there. You know, and they struck first, and that's a whole Donna and Wendy move right there. You know, go ahead, go ahead, fancy. One thing to point out is that um, this kind of hit me. It was a new thing recently. Is that there was that, that hearing on relocation um, that they keep talking about that was denied with prejudice. Um, Wendy, ha- Wendy, for that hearing, she had witnesses coming. Like I think that Gary Cohen guy was coming about the job offer. Like she, she, they were ready to have like a little mini trial. And before it even opened, that Judge Hobbs just said on its face, no, uh-uh, and just dismissed it right away. And that apparently was expected to go on and on and people are going to get involved. And that apparently was right up top. She dismissed that. And that was devastating. And I didn't realize that how that court proceeding particularly went on the relocation. Um, and I think that that also, too, just sort of fed. And he was also prepared to bring call witnesses and you know, to have a whole thing. And the judge just said, no. I'm looking at it right here. It's got a dad that's here. The mom's here as employee, just, you know, so it, you can't relocate. So that that's, that's another thing to think about a little bit in terms of the going back and forth, you know, she was fighting just as hard and bringing her little army and Tova, da, da, da. she wasn't just, that was her being the aggressor trying to take the kids away too. She's talking about how I didn't do anything aggressive. I was just responding to him. No, that's very aggressive. You're going to have a trial to try to take, move the kids away. And probably part of it too is despite the banana bread or whatever, the way this whole divorce went down, I mean, if you were a parent, would you want your kids to be with an in-law like so much like Donna? I mean, you start, I mean, you probably felt the vitriol and heard stories and knew things. I mean, you would want to, you know, especially after the kids started saying things. But so, I mean, the fight was the fight at that point. So yeah, he was mean. Yeah. He won. He was. I, I can't imagine. I like. I said we. I can't imagine what the shit that they put. I mean, we know some of the shit, but we don't know all the shit. We don't know the the conversations they had, or, or you know, we know that thing where the, they. I think it came out where they were at the soccer field or something, and they were pissed because, God forbid, he said he wanted to hang out with the kids or something, and like they lost their mind, and like that just consumes you when you're a parent who cares about your kids and all of a sudden there's this like you said there's that's aggressive you you all of a sudden you get a, and you're an attorney so you really know what's going like it's not like you have to talk to someone else that like you know that there this is a motion in court to take your kids and move away from you who you love like that like you said Fitz, that is aggressive and if you care for your kids that's that's like this that's war let's let's this we're not i'm not fucking 
But it's a ridiculous statement, too, that she would be like, oh, it wasn't really a big deal of emotion. And I didn't know. I mean, I've done a relocation case and you, you, I mean, why would you file it if you didn't want to win it? Yeah. That was just so ridiculous. And like you said, they didn't bring out, you know, because this trial wasn't against Wendy, but how many, she had witnesses, she had statements that she had taken. She was ready to a job offer to go to in Miami waiting for her and that boss. Mm-hmm. To testify. Yeah. Something that just a connection I just made sitting here thinking about it based on the fact of like one of the things about with Dan, the thing that did seem r- ridiculous to me in all fairness is the fact that he wanted an agreement to just go home and kiss his kids every night, like come in the door of his ex. That's a little much. That's a little I, much. I okay. Yeah, that's, that's a uh... little much. You don't need to see your ex every day like that. Um, but, uh, the thing that just hit me now is that when I was thinking about that point to bring up, you know, you have time to think about when other people are talking, the point you want to make. But you remember in the trial when Wendy said that she, the, the boys kissed a picture of Dan every night? Oh, my God. Yes, I remember that. So it's weird because almost like she's doing like what he wanted. She is giving him a kiss every night. And the kids that's so twisted. I just made that connection. I should do a Holy video side wow. by side. Fancy, I'm thinking too, when you say that, then I'm making the connection to you making the breastfeeding lie. I think to her, that is like a thing that she's showing the public, you know, like I'm doing the best thing for them. I'm letting them kiss their dad's picture every night, you know, giving him what he wanted. I breastfed both of that. I'm thinking about that. Like she's always trying to put this face on that's Mm -hmm. not real. She's Donna Showhorse. That's all she is. She's very well trained. She had a brutal trainer. We've all seen. <laughs> You're not that, kidding. That, that trainer had a whip. You know, so. Oh, you just you just angered me thinking about her saying, <laughs> "Oh man, what is what with her little with her little uh ugh 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 ugh." Uh, but anyway, I, it's been an hour and a half. We're gonna let you guys go. We can't. Yes. Yeah. We're, sorry. we're so sorry thank you guys so much for staying on this has been absolutely amazing and honestly like really it means a lot for you guys to come on i, I know you probably had a lot of uh people requesting it and for you guys to come on with us it really means a lot so thank you oh, that's sweet of you to say it's an honor you make me laugh jay online so thank you for that you have some real it's hard you know but you have some real time to get you get some real laughs for me so thank you for that well thank you for saying that that means that means everything to me when someone tells me that so thank you for saying that um yeah i don't know any any final thoughts or or, or I, we're gonna let you guys go uh, by the way again we've been sharing the links if you're watching this on the replay we'll, it's going to be in the, in the description you're not going to get any better <laughs> information than fancy on the, on this case so patreon uh youtube twitter and also we got katie uh, kathy it's kathy katie i but real name <laughs> kathy remember. goes by katie cool lady make sure you're checking out her website make sure you're checking out uh instagram that is in there um this has been amazing uh and the, the, the blog go ahead go ahead kathy go ahead i just want to say one more plug for the society page because oh, yeah, they're been... one of the most brilliant videos on wendy that you have to see like i mean it could be an opening statement. It's so good, and and they did it with uh, Jippers. Is a with oh, I've G- seen that account. Yeah, yeah. And that's a that's a play on how a weird spelling of Jibbers. You yeah. get okay, that. Okay, right yeah. the it, it has excerpts of the drive that Fancy and I made to the crime scene is woven into it. But the way this video is laid out and showing Wendy's different testimonies and the three trials and just how brilliantly this thing is choreographed is just like really no good. doubt no doubt it's really really good and if you haven't seen it you just got to go to the society page and see i don't know what the name of this video is but you know it, it, i'm sure it would be easy to find it's about the drive to the crime scene it's all about yeah. wendy and it's brilliant it's so green go border. Because i know that it has a green border visually i can see it so I look for green they I were they, in the they description were, box they were that. in the they were in the chat so hopefully they i don't know yep. if they're still here but uh make sure you're checking that out guys check them both uh of their pages and we when we end this it's going to publicly buzz tonight at 10 uh, o'clock so, or no nine nine or nine thirty so make sure the portal is going to take you there make sure you like that stream um they're going to do a great show tonight so uh guys again thank you so much we really appreciate it and uh thank you, and shannon have a good night thank everybody you. pleasure good night pleasure good night yeah.
Cubs. <laughs>